Fed up with the everyday grind? Tired out by the dull routine? You want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You're alone in the jungle with three men. You know that one of them is a desperate criminal whom you've come to arrest, but you don't know which one. You have to find him before he can save himself by killing you. Today we escape from reality into the depths of a tropical jungle in a tantalizing search for a murder. As L.G. Blockman told it in his famous story, Red Wine. The rusty little tramp freighter bumped against the rickety wharf, and I dropped from the rail onto the planking. For the first time, felt the humid heat roll out of the jungle. This was... Tanjong Samar, sweltering, half forgotten, last outpost on the rubber coast of Borneo. I crossed the beach and walked up the path of crushed shells leading to a low bungalow at the edge of the jungle. The freighter would lie at the wharf for four hours, plenty of time for me to get the thing over with and be back aboard when she sailed. I was expecting trouble, of course, but no real danger. I'd done jobs like this before. Or at least I thought this would be the same. I thought so until I stepped up on the porch and met Herr Kurt, controller of the Tanjong Samar district. Yeah, I'm Herr Kurt, the controller. What is it I can do for you? Well, my name's Paul Vernier, Mr. Kurt. I have a letter of introduction here from the governor general. Mm-hmm. The... There you are. Yeah. Mr. Paul Vernier from the United States. Huh? Yeah, uh, the governor promised me your cooperation. So I see. Cooperation is good, but it does not say cooperation in what? I've come here after a killer, Mr. Kurt. Oh? Dayaks, maybe? Headhunters? No, this one's a civilized killer. An American wanted in San Francisco for murdering his wife. His name is Jerome Steaks. I see. Won't you sit down, Mr. Fenio? Hey. Won't him, you call. He died in Jeffrey. Shit, Juan, I'll bring right away. We'll have coffee in a moment. Oh, nice of you, but I, maybe I'd better pick this guy up first. I'd hate to miss the boat and have to lay over five days. You're acquainted with this... Steaks, Mr. Vernier? No, I've never seen him. You have photographs? Right, <laughs> not. Nor fingerprints. Now, this happened two years ago. Until last month, we had it listed as a double suicide. Oh, what are you driving at, Mr. Kurt? Simply this. There's no one in my district by the name of Steaks. <laughs> no, he wouldn't be using his own name, of course. There is an American here, though. <laughs> Three of them, Mr. Vernier. Employed as foreman on the Kota rubber plantation here at Tanjong Sama. Uh, according to my information, Steaks came here from Batavia about six months ago. <laughs> they all arrived six months ago on the same boat. The coal tar company is just going back into operation, you understand? I see. Well, according to people who have seen him, Jerome Steaks is a man about 35 years old, of medium height, slight build, pale complexion with black hair and mustache. Amazing. Any one of these men might fit that description. Except that all are clean-shaven and heavily tanned from the tropical sun. Furthermore, Mr. Fenio, all three of the men have light blonde hair. Good. Pour two cups, one. I'll have one bring your baggage up from the wharf, Mr. Fenio. It appears your business may take a little longer than four hours. I'm certain of the information I got in Batavia. I know the man's here. Uh, then the problem resolved itself into a matter of identification. Huh? Well, an hour's talk with the three of them ought to do that. Mm. I doubt that, Mr. Finio. The swamps here at Tanjong Sama are infested with fever. Oh. Cream. Okay. It is always hot, like now. And the jungles back there swarm with krites. Krites? A uh, deadly little snake, no longer near your forearm. There you are. You. And in the rivers, there are crocodiles. So? Men rarely come here Unless they are running away from something, trying to lose their past. I think you'll find all three men have manufactured stories. 
So, how is one to choose? Well, sometimes a man can be identified by his personality. Oh, uh-huh. and the personality of this man Steeks is, um... It's something out of the ordinary. For a foreman on a rubber plantation, yes. I, I doubt if all three of these men can be aristocrats. And in a sense, well, that's what Steeks is, a cosmopolitan. He's lived all around the world, always associating with top society. He's a lover of fine foods and wine, speaks French and German fluently. What's oh, so? wrong? Well, he's a gourmet, a bon vivant, a man of perfect taste in clothes and manners. And a murderer. Yeah, and a murderer. Yeah, well, when just three men return this evening, I shall be most happy to introduce you to them. Though it's quite probable they are aware of your identity already. My mm-hmm. houseboy there told me you were a detective before you stepped off the wharf. Oh, I see. So in other words, the murderer probably knows who I am and what I'm here for, but I haven't the slightest idea who he is. <laughs> exactly. It's quite an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, more coffee, Mr. Finneo? Mr. Veneer, I should like you to meet uh, Mr. Doran. Hi, Mr. Veneer. Hi, Mr. Veneer. Hi, this is Mr. Wilmetting. Hi, Mr. Veneer. My name is Prale. Glad to meet you. Oh, same here, Mr. Prale. Might as well drop the mister. We don't use him much around here. I'm Prale. That's Doran. That's Wilmetting. You're Veneer, if it's all the same to you. Well, sure, Prale. Why not? Now, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I have a number of things to do. Uh, will you bring Mr. Veneer to my bungalow for dinner? Uh, we'll celebrate having a guest in Tanjong somehow. Oh, yeah? Sure. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, Herr Kurt tells me all three of you are Americans. I don't know whether I'm still one or not. Haven't been to the States in seven years. Oh, seven years, huh? And you're an old-timer here, Duran. No, not here. Australia. Uh, Don't get him started, Vernier. He'll spend two hours telling you how he lost his shirt trying to raise sheep down there. (laughs) If I had either money or sense, I wouldn't have come to this stinking hole. Oh, I wouldn't say you fellas had it too rough. I've uh, been noticing those empty bottles there on the shelf. What do you mean, Vernier? Hmm. Paul Messon, 1936. That's good champagne. Mm-hmm. <coughs> you boys are living like connoisseurs. Oh, no, no, you're overrating us, Vernier. Those uh, empty bottles were already here when we came. Oh? Just never got around to throwing them out. Prale here is the only connoisseur in the bunch. He can tell you anything you want to know about wines. Yeah. Or about anything. Uh, dry up just because a guy happens to know a little more than somebody else. There's no reason to keep riding them all the time. I wish you knew some way to make ice. I'm getting plenty fed up with warm beer day in and day out. Yeah, that would get pretty tiresome. I think I'd switch to Chambertin or Chablis or something. Hmm? Uh, come again? Well, I didn't necessarily mean those in particular, but there are quite a number of wines that are even better warm than they are chilled. Now you're in the wrong place, Chum. We wouldn't know what to do with them if we had them. This is strictly a beer and gin crowd. Well, there'd be no kick on that if we had some ice to go with it. Boy, what I wouldn't give for a cold, frosty bottle. Oh, relax, will you, Wilmer Ding? You're making me thirsty. Uh, <laughs> how about some music? Music? Uh, does one of you play some instruments? Sure, Prail. He's terrific on that phonograph over there in the corner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Only trouble is he thinks three o'clock in the morning is the greatest song ever written. Well, I I can see that that would lead to quite an argument, Doran, particularly if you're a lover of the classics. I don't know. I don't go for that long hair stuff. Oh. But I would like to hear a fast number once in a while. It's less than ten years old. Yeah, you ought to see this collection, Prale, dragged up here from Batavia, strictly from the gay 90s. Uh, Prale, you don't by any chance have a number called Ilium Meroutier dans cette maison. Ah, some Italian opera. Oh, no, no, it's French. Well, come on, Braille, translate it for us. You claim to be an expert on the French language. Oh, it's worded kind of funny, like poetry. Ah, sure, sure. Yeah, that last word, though, uh, maison, that means house, I know that. (laughs) Well, it's too bad. I thought maybe Jerome Steaks might translate it. It refers to him, of course. What are you talking about? The sentence reads, there is a murderer in this house. Huh? Well... So you're finally coming out in the open, huh? Yeah. We heard you were a detective, Vernier. You're after some killer you've never seen named Steeks. You figure one of us is it. Huh? That's right, Prale. And the guy you're after is Wilmerding. Are you crazy? Who ever heard of anybody with a name like Wilmerding unless they made it up? Made up nothing. I got a passport to prove it. What are you trying to do, Prale? 
turn attention away from yourself. Look, I got nothing to hide. It's either you or Duran. You ah. can leave me out of this right now. There's plenty of people in Australia who can tell you who I am. Unfortunately, though, there's nobody in Tanjong Sama who can tell me for certain who any of you are. One of you is a murderer, and by the time the boat gets back here, I'll know which one. Either I'm going to take Jerome Steaks back to San Francisco, or I'm going to kill him trying to. You can count on it. Well, what do you say we go on over to Kurt's bungalow and have dinner, hmm? That's Wilmerting's room there. Doran sleeps here. Uh-huh. And Prelon down at the end. I see. And uh, this is the guest room. Oh. At least the only guest room that's usable at present. Well, it looks all right. Well, it's yours for the time you're here, Mr. Veneer. Oh, do all of these rooms open out under the porch? Yes, the veranda, as we call it here. And there's no way to lock this door? Unfortunately, no. Anyway, the windows are covered only by mosquito netting. <laughs> it makes another interesting situation, does it not? Yeah, I suppose interesting is the word for it. Most likely all these gentlemen are acting to a greater or lesser extent, which, of course, makes your problem exceedingly difficult. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mr. Kurt, you uh, did say a man rarely came here unless he wanted to lose his past. And yet, you're here. Yeah, and it is true. But then, I'm only a servant of the government and have little choice where I'm sent, no? Well... Good night, Mr. Veneal. Uh, good night, Mr. Kurt. I trust you'll have a very comfortable night. Thank you. I sat there for a long time after Kurt left, trying to figure things out, getting nowhere. This was Borneo, and though the Coleman lantern on the table at my elbow threw a blaze of white light into every corner of the room... Outside that light lay the dark veranda, and beyond that, the jungle. Gradually, the night breeze brought the smell of the jungle into the room, as rich and as exotic as the scent of taboo, fragrant as midnight orchid, as disturbing as the scent of danger. Or maybe, maybe it was danger itself I was smelling. A heavy knife missed my throat by two inches. Thudded into the bamboo partition and stuck there, quivering. I doused the lantern in one sweep, dropped down on the floor, and slid my thirty-eight out of its holster. I could hear nothing but the rustle of palm thatch along the eaves. Low creaks from the pilings underneath the bungalow. And the soft night sounds from the jungle. Finally, I slipped my shoes off, pulled the knife out of the wall, and dropped it in my pocket. Moved to the door and stepped quietly out onto the veranda. It was empty. Across the railing, the fringe of undergrowth was dappled in silver moonlight. Nothing moved. I paused quickly at the three doors, and from each heard the sound of snoring. One of the men was faking, but which one? I'd reached the end of the porch when my eye caught a slight movement in the banana clump a few yards from the steps. Someone was hiding there. I moved swiftly, holding the gun ready. Came within a few feet before I could make out a shape in a red and white sarong, complete with dark tumbled curls and a flower behind one ear. It was a girl. Please, Tuan. The gun. You are going to shoot me? Oh, no. no. Relax, honey. I was looking for somebody else. Oh. And now you have found Nelana, so you are disappointed? Well, I... Look, did you see anybody moving around up there on the veranda a while ago? Only you, Thuan. I became frightened and ran to hide. Frightened? Why? I should not be here. At night, I mean. I... Oh, let us talk of something else, huh? All right, Nelana. Thuan, do you like Nelana, perhaps? Definitely. Why do we not go somewhere else? Along the beach, perhaps? You would like that? Mr. Well, Veneer uh, is too serious-minded for such things, Nelana. Oh, Veneer. Well, Mr. Kurt, join us, won't you? Thank you. Nelana, go to the bungalow at once. Yes, Veneer. Yes, I go. I go immediately. She has no business being out alone at night. But, Mr. Veneer, is something wrong with your room? It's not comfortable? It was until this flew in through the window. A knife? Hmm? Yeah, a throwing knife. 
Ever see it before? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's one of the collections there in the bungalow. The three Americans throw them at targets every evening and wager on the results. I believe uh, Mr. Doran taught the other two. What about you, Mr. Kurt? Do you ever bet with them? It would be too easy. Watch. Oh. I learned to throw a knife in Java many years ago. And Nalana, I suppose she's an expert at it too. Nalana knows nothing of knives. Her greatest accomplishment is that of making friends too easily. I see. Just who is she anyway? Does she live here? Yeah, she lives here. She is my wife. Your, your wife? Exactly. My wife. Good night, Mr. Vanier. In just a moment, we will return to Escape. But first, coming to you in succession, Spike Jones, Jack Benny, and Amos and Andy bring you 90 nonstop minutes of superlative joy every Sunday night when you hear them among CBS's 10 great Sunday night shows. The Spike Jones Show and Amos and Andy are heard over most of these same CBS stations. And Jack Benny comes to you over them all. And now with our star, Jeff Chandler, we return to the second act of Escape and Red Wine. When I finally turned in that night, I didn't make the mistake of lighting the lantern again. Being a target once in an evening was enough. I undressed in the dark, pushed the bed up to block the door, propped a chair against the windowsill, and lay down on the floor. I kept trying to fit some theory together to account for the things that had happened. When I drifted off to sleep, I was no nearer any answer than before. I woke up with the first light of dawn. For a full minute, was ready to predict a peaceful day. And then I turned my head slightly and saw it. On the floor, against the wall, 18 inches from my left hand, its eyes open and unmoving, lay a Krite, first cousin to the cobra, the deadliest snake in Borneo. Cold sweat broke out of my forehead, ran into the corners of my eyes. Not daring to make any sudden move, I slid my right hand slowly up behind me and found my gun under the pillow. The snake moved slightly. I froze for one long minute. Carefully, I brought the gun over until I had the ugly head centered above the foresight. Then... What? Hey, come for this? Hold it. Hold it. Who fired that shot? I did, Kurt, in here. Hey, Kurt, what's all the shooting about? Find out now, Gerard. Mr. Vanille, you all right? Oh, sure, Kurt. Come on in. I, I had an early morning visitor there on the floor. I caught a crate. Did he bite you? No, no, he what didn't. What the devil's all the racket about? Ah, snake. That's funny. What's funny, Duran? A crate, Wilma Ding. Just killed one here in my room. Well, there's plenty of them around, but I never heard of one crawling into a room before. I'm not sure it did crawl in. What do you mean? I've got an idea it may have been dropped in through the mosquito netting there at the window. Yeah? yeah. By whom? By a guy named Jerome Steaks. Ever hear of him, Duran? Why don't you pick up Wilma Ding? He's your man. Oh, sure, sure. I always carry a couple of snakes around in my pocket just for luck. What I want to know is who carries this around in their pocket for luck. That's one of our nice in the living room. We throw him at a target. Yeah, I know. Only last night, I was the target. And Prale's your boy. He's an expert. Wins every time we play. Dry up, Duran. Hey, hey, listen, you man. Crack oh, like okay, that relax, up. all of you. All right. So nobody knows anything about these accidents. They just happen. But here's a warning to whichever one of you is, Steaks. The next time, you better cover yourself. I'm through being a clay pigeon. From now on, it's going to be a lot tougher. A whole lot tougher. That day passed, the next, I got exactly nowhere. Things didn't fit, didn't add up. I saw Nelana several times, but had no chance to speak to her. When Herr Kurt was with me, she'd pass without a glance, but if I was alone, she'd manage a quick, provocative smile that sent shivers down my spine. By the fourth day, the tension among us had grown almost unbearable. The steamer was due the next evening on its return trip to Batavia. I needed a break of some kind, had to have one. Well, it came at dusk when I dropped into my room to change for dinner. Tuan. Hmm? It is I, Nilana. Nilana, what the devil are you doing here? To see you, Tuan. 
Does that make you unhappy? Oh, no, but I doubt if Herr Kurt would think much of the idea. Oh, no, he must not find out. That is why I hide here and wait for you. Oh, but he may walk in here any moment. That is true, Twan. It is why I cannot stay now. But I wish something to ask you. All right, honey, shoot. It is true that you look for a man who has killed a woman in your United States? Yeah, that's right. A man who now names himself by another name? Yes, no, Anna, do it you know... It is perhaps the same one who one night threw the knife at you? Yeah, I think so. Do you know who it is? I saw the knife thrown to one. I was outside, oh, but... be quiet. Oh, it is someone. Yeah, it's Herr Kurt. Oh. He's going into the living room. But he will come here when he does not find you. Oh, I am very frightened, Twan. I must go. Oh, no, wait. I've got to know. No, no. There's no time now. Tonight, when everyone sleeps, yeah. wait by the tall palm at the edge of the clearing. I will come. All right, I'll be there. Nelana has done foolish things, Twan. But tonight she will fix it all good. You come. I waited for a long time in the shadow by the palm tree. Watch the moonlight sift down through the shaggy fronds. But two hours passed. She didn't come. Waiting there, though, in the jungle night, a plan began to form in my mind. A long shot, true enough, but one with possibilities. It needed luck to work, but I'd come to the point where I had to count on a little luck. At any rate, I decided to start the ball rolling the next morning, after breakfast. Now, wait a minute, Vernier. Let's get this straight. And I thought I'd put it straight enough, Dorana. I said the hunt's off. I'm pulling out on that boat tonight. You can all relax. Yeah, but uh, five days ago, you were so cockeyed sure it was one of us. How come the switch? Five days ago, Wilma Ding, I didn't know you guys. I was certain of the information I'd picked up in Batavia. And I'm not so certain of it now. What changed your mind? A sweet disposition? Uh, no, exactly the opposite, Frail. Now, I doubt very much if any of you guys is who he claims to be. I wouldn't be surprised if Doran, Wilmerding, and Prell are all phony names, but that's not my business. I came here after Steaks. I've decided now I made a mistake, and that's that. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, aren't you forgetting the fact that somebody tried to knock you off a couple of times? Well, let's just say the reason for that was a side issue. It had nothing to do with Steaks. You come in here, push us around for a week, and then decide it was all a mistake. I'm sorry, Prale. And look, I, I'm going to try to make up for it this evening. I'm throwing a dinner party at Herr Kurt's bungalow before the boat leaves tonight. You're, you're all invited. Yeah, now that's pretty decent of you, Vernier. I'll get some food and drinks from the captain as soon as he docks. If you're as fed up with rice duffel and warm beer as I am, you'll be ready for a change. Yeah. Sure is all right with me. Oh, good, good. Then it's all settled. And I can promise you at least... Two surprise dishes. Maybe three, if you care for I beg for your it. pardon, gentlemen. Oh, Herr Kurt, come on in. I was wondering if any of you had seen Nelana this morning. Mm -hmm. Not me. Well, yeah, what's seen. wrong, Herr Kurt? I'm rather concerned about her, Mr. Veneer. She has not been home since early last night. I had a couple of ideas about that myself. Ideas I wished I didn't have. Anyway, as soon as the rest of the bunch went about their business, I began my own search for Nelana. I didn't know the country, and it was nearly dusk before I found her. Then I said nothing about it to anyone. But sitting at the table that night while the dinner party moved along, I was seeing everything through a haze of red. The same color as the red in a sarong wrapped around the slim figure of a beautiful girl. I kept thinking how she'd never smile anymore, how she'd never walk in the moonlight again, because somebody had cut her throat. <laughs> <laughs> I know a story along the same lines. I never heard that one before. Ah, oh, what a dinner. Boy, oh, after six months of rife stuff, I'd like to go crazy about this. Huh. Yeah, when you throw one, Veneer, you really throw it. That's right. well, this is only the beginning. Beginning? Where can you go from here? <laughs> well, right now, for instance, roast pheasant. Mm. All right, Wong, bring it over. Sure, Twan. Right away, I bring. Ooh, Would you like for me that. to put here for you <laughs> to carve, Twan? Uh, no, no, I, uh, I wonder if you'd mind carving it here, Kurt. Not at all, Mr. Vanier. I should be happy to place it here, one. Boy, I haven't had roast pheasants since Australia. We used to shoot them all the time. Even the smell's enough to drive you crazy. Ah, you said it, Prale. Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. The pheasant is the main dish, so the two surprises go right along with it. Uh, Wong, bring it out. Sir, Twan, I bring right away now. Uh, careful, don't drop it. Ooh, there yeah, we are. Thanks. Boy. 
Oh. Well, there you are. It's hey. Chambertin, vintage wine. 1911. Yeah. Unquestionably the finest red wine that exists in the world today. Holy smoke, hmm. where'd you get it? Oh, I, I found out on the trip in the captain of the steamer had a few bottles. Took a lot of talking to get one out of him, but, uh -huh. but I'll open it, Wong. Have you, have you got the glasses? Sure, twice. Good. Well, boys, you may go back to warm beer tomorrow, but you got the best tonight. <laughs> Now, Wong, uh, show him a second surprise. One big bucket ice. Ice! Real honest to gosh, cracked ice. Oh, I haven't seen a chunk of ice for six months. Oh, I thought you'd go for that one. All right, Wong, serve the wine, will you? Sure, fine. You know, it was pretty amazing to find 1911 Chambertin on a little tramp freighter down here in the South Pacific. The stuff's so rare, it's hard to get at any price anymore. Eh, maybe so, but that ice is what gets me. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, Wong. Dump plenty in mine. Oh, Wong, stop that. What the devil are you... Uh... What's the matter, Wilma Ding? Uh, what? Why? why... Well, I, what I mean is I... You mean you're well aware of the fact that ice kills the bouquet of Chambertin. Isn't that it? Steaks? Steaks? You mean Wilma Ding Yes, is... yes. Once a gourmet, always a gourmet. A crook with enough sense to keep his hair dyed black for years so he could become a natural blonde if he ever had to make a getaway but not enough sense to keep still and let me ruin a bottle of wine. Hey, easy with those hands. Don't try reaching for a gun. Let him reach for it, Mr. Fennell. Uh, Kurt, no. Put down that knife. Let go, Veneers. Go for his gun. Too late. Kurt. Good Lord, Kurt. You've killed him. I'm sorry you do not have our prisoner to take back with you, Mr. Veneer. But I, too, found her body. I knew you had been there. I saw your footprints. I'm sorry, Kurt. And she was... She, she had... had been seeing Wilmerling. I had guessed it was one of them. And apparently she found out he was Steaks. Yeah, I know. That's what she was going to tell me, only he didn't give her a chance. She was young, Mr. Vanilla. Foolish, perhaps. But I... I loved her very much. Hey, look... He knocked over the bottle of wine. It's pouring out all over the place. Yeah. Brother, what a mess. Yeah, Duran. It's quite a mess. Only one thing, though. Not all of it is red wine. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have presented transcribed Red Wine by L.G. Blockman, adapted for radio by Mort Lewis and Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Starred as Paul Vernier was Jeff Chandler, with Barry Kroger as Hare Kurt. Featured players were David Ellis, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, and Lorette Philbrandt. The special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are flying over the lonely wastes of the Pacific, lost... Torn by the fury of a typhoon, your gasoline running out, and ahead of you is an adventure so strange, so terrifying, that your mind cannot accept it. Next week, we escape with Nelson Bond's gripping story of a fantastic Conqueror's Isle. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again CBS offers you... Escape! Broadway is my beat, says Danny Clover, and he's proud of it. Tomorrow afternoon, over most of these same CBS stations, you'll hear the first of Danny's adventures. You'll hear how a real cop with a real purpose for running down a murderer goes about his business, backed by the world's largest police department. Listen in as Danny declares... Broadway is my beat. Now, stay tuned for five minutes of the latest news to be followed by Let's Pretend over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>